Um, these are the organizing committee members. And if you see any of these women, please thank them for their hard work. They've worked, we've all worked very hard to hopefully make this week a success. And so um, please thank those that you see that have helped with this organization. And finally, a word to our sponsors. We thank very much the sponsors that helped make this financially possible, um, and along with all the many exhibitors. So with that, I'm very happy now to uh, turn the program over to um, our honorary general chair, Regina Baichi. She is the mother of robotics. <laughs> Good morning. Are you up? Mother is talking. <laughs> well, I will introduce uh, Daniela Rus very shortly, but I can't help to do a little reminiscence since I am probably one of the older or oldest person in this audience. You and we together should take great pride considering how far we came. If I tell you that in the early 70s, and some of the colleagues are here, Hirochi Kaino and, and few others, there were in this Ikra about 100 people. Hundred. Today we have 2,700 registered participants. I mean, that is impact. Uh, we came a long way, and um, it's we had ups and downs. But overall, I want to make a plea to the next generation. Ask hard questions. Be bold. Whether you are in academia or in industry, dream. Dream big. That's what we did. And here we are. Thank you. Now, it's my real pleasure to introduce and if I may say so, my professional daughter, Daniela Rus, who is a professor of electrical engineering computer science. She's Andrew Emma Witterby, professor. Um, she's from MIT, if you didn't notice. And um, she has got various memberships of fellowships of AAA, AAA, um, IEEE, ACM, you know, all these acronyms. And very recently she got elected to the highest honor in our engineering society to the National Academy of Engineering. I knew, or I first got to know Daniela about 20, plus years ago, uh, when I visited her when she was still at Dartmouth. She just graduated from Cornell, and she was into this modular robotics. One thing was very striking. She has a lot of energy, enthusiasm, ambition, creativity. And so what you will hear today is another step in this creative endeavor. Daniel Arus. I forgot to say one more thing. You see, mother forgets. It is as a mother with great pride looking at your children, how they become great women. Thank you so much, uh, Regina, for this warm introduction. And thank you for inviting me to speak um, today. 
it is a great honor, it is a special privilege, and it's really exciting, uh, especially since some of the most exciting ideas about robotics are in this room, and some of my most favorite people in the world are in this room, as are my hopes for the future. Now, I love robots. As a kid, I watched reruns of Lost in Space, and I used to fantasize about entering the story and joining the robot and Will Robinson in their adventures. Um, Will Robinson was a computer prodigy kid, and I thought he was very cool. But I have not thought about studying robots until um, until the moment captured in this picture, when as an undergraduate student studying computer science, uh, I met John Hawcroft after a talk he gave. And in this talk, he said classical computer science was done. And it was time for the grand applications of computing. And how much grander than robotics. So I was excited. And John then asked me, could I develop an algorithm for a robot to make and uh, bring me coffee? And I had no idea how this could work. In fact, in my mind, my context was a little bit like this. But I got to graduate school and I found robots that looked like this. And after some years, I had PhD results that looked like this. So I could not solve the coffee challenge problem. But I worked on pushing, reorienting, and various aspects of fine motion planning. It turned out that the theory was really hard, and the experiments were even harder, because we did not have robots that could um, execute the motions required by the theory. Well, somewhere along the way, I started working with Bruce Donald and Jim Jennings. And Bruce had these awesome robots whose names were Tommy and Lily. These were some of the first uh, mobile robots um, uh, that were invented. So we realized that the algorithms I thought of for um, in-hand motion planning could actually be used to move furniture, that we could think of the robots, of the mobile robots, as fingertips that could manipulate objects of comparable size. And in this case, the objects uh, were um, furniture. So here are Tommy and Lily uh, implementing um, some of the uh, theory of fine motion planning for dexterous manipulation, um, but implemented on top of um, furniture. So, okay, so let's fast forward some years later, and now it is my turn to ask my students, can you solve the coffee challenge? And my students say, no problem. And within a few minutes, they come up with this. Let's just watch for a couple of uh, moments. What would you like to have today? How about some coffee, strong and with sugar, please? Coffee is coming right away. Thank you. Here is some coffee and sugar for you. Oh, thank you so much. One packet, that is perfect. Okay, in fact, um, with my students, we tackled much more complex um, cooking uh, tasks. Uh, we, uh, we tasked, uh, we challenged, sorry. <laughs> we tackled baking. Um, so here, um, the task required the understanding of natural language. Um, it required fine compliant motion planning. It uh, required new algorithms um, for um, vision. So here's the robot um, we developed. Uh, we call this robot fondly BakeBot. Uh, this robot makes edible cookies by searching a database of recipes. The recipes are written in natural language. The recipes are then parsed into actions that are executable by the robot. And then the robot has the ingredients in a mise en place setting. The robot uses a laser scanner to find the balls, and the robot uses vision to find ingredients to uh, differentiate between things like butter, sugar, and flour, uh, which are all white, and also to find if there are extra scraps left in um, the bowl. So um, the robot is very careful uh, with its ingredients. Here's the cookie. And in fact, after some time uh, in uh, the oven, um, the cookie is actually tasty and edible. This happens to be one of my favorite cookies, the chocolate afghan. 
Okay, so we moved from the coffee challenge to furniture manipulation and to cooking and many other tasks because as a community we made tremendous progress in making and controlling robots. And these, some of the, these are some of the amazing robots that uh, we have today. But what I would like is a world where robots are as common as phones and we are not there yet. So what if robots were to become a utility, available anywhere, anytime to help with physical tasks? Well then we would have the world of pervasive robotics, the connected world of many people, many robots doing many tasks. And you may call me an optimist, but I can really picture a world rich with robots where, for example, shopping might look like this. And by the way, if you can count correctly the number of robots in this picture, you get a prize. Okay, so imagine getting up and sending your personal delivery robot to the store to bring you fresh bread, fruit, and uh, milk. And uh, the store is abuzz with people and robots. Some people may want to arrive at the store um, uh, to do their own shopping, and they may arrive in self-driving cars. And at the, uh, at the store, they may encounter self-driving carts that could direct them um, to their items and uh, could tell them about the provenance, freshness, uh, and nutrition content of the products. And at the store, you may have other robots. Some robots are, uh, some robots may be stocking shelves, other robots may be cleaning the uh, street, cleaning the windows, or um, delivering products for cost, uh, customers. Now, such a world is very large and complex. And in this world, we have many robots that sense, compute, and move in support of their tasks. These robots also interact with each other and exchange information with people and often specialize so that they could uh, deliver on their tasks most effectively. So this idea, pervasive robotics, is a big challenge. But its scope is not unlike the challenge of pervasive computing, which was formulated about 25 years ago. And look where we are today with computing. Computing has truly become a utility. So what would it take to have um, robotics a, a utility? Well, Mark Weiser said of pervasive computing, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. Computation and information have become democratized. And it seems to me that the next logical step is the physical tasks. And that's where we come in. Now, transportation is already moving in this direction. Many major car manufacturers have announced self-driving car efforts in the recent past, and this could mean that in the, uh, in the future, in the near future, we will have consumer products. And these consumer products might deliver uh, autonomy um, uh, on demand, uh, mobility on demand for all. So meaning that going anywhere, anytime, could become conveniently available, even without a driver's license. So then you can read and drive, maybe you can even drink and drive. Um, your car can do things like refueling while you're asleep, and uh, many other things. So I have been working in Singapore as part of an MIT Singapore team to build self-driving cars for about five years. And this is our fleet of cars developed to deliver mobility on demand. We have autonomous golf carts and autonomous electric vehicles. The idea is that if you want to go somewhere, you book a ride, a robot comes to get you. After the robot drops you off, the robot talks with the other robots and with the people waiting for rides and figures out the optimal location where to go and pick up a customer. Now this past October we invited the public to try our robots at the Chinese Garden in Singapore. Um, this is a natural but not very complex um, space and here you can see the map, the roads and the pick up and drop off points. So people could book rides at home and then they would show up at the designated location at the designated time to get a ride with a robot. We did this for about six days. We gave rides to over 500 people and uh, we traveled several hundred kilometers. 
These robots are fairly minimalist. Um, they have just a couple of laser scanners and cameras uh, that are used um, to detect static and dynamic obstacles. And the system uses a map that is acquired by driving around the space a few times uh, before the exper experiment begins. Um, the environment has uh, golf carts, robot carts, uh, people and bicyclists. So let's hear what people had to say. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, awesome because this is our very first time. <laughs> no, yeah, the pace was alright, and um, when there are two guys walking in front, right, you actually slow down. So this will help uh, other people with mobility problems, disabled, even children and families that um, don't really suited for walking long distances to come to the garden as well. So I think we have early adopters. Now some parts of the autonomous driving problem are solved, driving at low um, speeds in low complexity environments. But other parts remain very difficult, driving in weather, in rain, in snow, in congestion. The more complex the environment, the harder the problem. And this is true for many uh, applications of robotics. So it turns out that we have many gaps that need to be filled along the path to pervasive robotics. Some gaps pertain to the interactions between robots and between robots and people. Other gaps concern the computation performed the, uh, by the robots, and some other gaps concern the creation of robots. So for the rest of the talk, I would like to share a few ideas about what we can do to improve communication, computation, and the making of robots. So let's start with communication. Turns out robots still have a limited ability to communicate with other robots and with people. And as many of you know, I have spent many years uh, trying to improve the capabilities of multi-robot systems. But communication remains a challenge. And a good example to see this is the packbots in Iraq. Uh, the robots often uh, got outside of communication range and people had to go to retrieve them manually. Um, uh, later, eventually, the robot got in hand so it could uh, backtrack its steps to the latest communication um, spot. So the problem is that modeling and predicting communication is notoriously hard. And any robot control method that relies on these, method, uh, on these models is fraught with noise. A common assumption is that two robots can communicate if they are within communication range. But this is not true at all. In this picture, uh, we have plotted the communication quality between two robots within communication range. In red, um, no communication. In yellow, so-so communication. And in green, good communication. So you can see that the yellow and red are interspersed with the green. All right, so what can we uh, improve here? Well, it turns out we can actually measure local communication, and that is much better than trying to predict it. So if you spin the robot in place, and if you take advantage of the channel information and of multipath, you can create 360 degree profiles of the communication quality. In other words, uh, in this example, the triangle robot wants to talk to the diamond robots. And here you can see that there is a good communication path at 35 degrees and one at 140 degrees. So by spinning the robot in place, uh, we can acquire this profile that can act as a virtual sensor for communication. And with this, we can begin to treat communication much like we treat perception as a measurement. And we can tie it in the control loop uh, of a robot as, as measurement, not as a model. And, for ex and we can solve many problems. So for example, we can develop optimization and control algorithms for networks of robot base stations that will guarantee communication needs of robots anywhere, anytime. And if we can do this, we can begin to talk about large-scale networks of robots at the planet scale. Uh, and these networks of flying robots could, in principle, provide communication coverage and internet to all parts of the planet, including the development world where uh, there is no internet available today. So robots could be a very important part of a grand challenge, um, the grand challenge of providing internet access to anybody um, on the planet. And this is a very exciting opportunity for our field. 
Okay, but robots also need to be more capable. And the second gap I would like to talk about briefly um, is the brain of the robot. So we are on a very positive steep gradient for making ever more capable robots. Today's robots are capable of um, agile com um, locomotion on the ground, in the air, and in water. They can make maps, they can find static objects and moving objects, they can classify objects, they can work with each other, they can work with people, they can imitate people, they can even play soccer. And this is tremendous progress uh, for our community. However, today's robots still have a limited ability to figure things out because in current robot programs, the plan and control is uh, very carefully specified and the ability to change it is fairly limited. So what can we do? Well, we can do many things, but here's just one idea. Today we can record everything a robot does. And these robots' past experiences uh, can be a rich source for decision making, especially for robots that operate pervasively for long periods of time. But this data would be too big and too low level. But what if we can extract the salient, the semantic points in the data and somehow map them to words and abstractions? For example, for a GPS stream, we would like to have street addresses in, in, instead of GPS points, and we only need one or two points to get the street address. And if we have street addresses, uh, we can connect these street addresses to activities using the world's knowledge, using online repositories. So for instance, a shopping robot arriving at Starbucks coffee in, um, in Seattle might use the Yelp databases to find out that good coffee can be bought there. Um, or a robot arriving at the convention center on May 27th, 2015 might figure out using IEEE databases that its future is being invented and it better pay attention. Okay, so there are many different ways in which we can approach these problems, which I think have huge potential for robots, but I would just like to do a small detour to tell you about one technique that I am particularly excited about because I think it has potential to help many different robotics tasks. And this is the idea of finding semantic points in your data called corsets. Now, corsets allow us to use um, slow algorithms on large data by carefully finding a small subset of the data on which to run with a guarantee that the computed result is an approximation of running uh, the algorithm on the entire data set which is intractable. So, Core sets are especially suited for robots because they can be computed incrementally. And here's how this might work. Uh, you might see a chunk of data, figure out its core set or semantic points, and later on you might see another chunk of data, compute another core set. Well, the, um, two core sets can be compressed into a core set of core sets and so forth. Now, the guaranteed error you get through this computation um, increases as you go up in the tree. But if we um, expect uh, this compression to be high, in other words, we expect the tree to be shallow, that is not a big problem. And it turns out that it's not so difficult to compute these ideas. And I just want to give you an intuition for how the algorithm works using the GPS example. So say we have a stream of um, n GPS points. And we have a number of segments k that can be learned from the complexity of the data. And we have some desired approximation error epsilon. Um, the first step in computing the core set for the GPS set is to compute the k segment mean, which can be done with off-the-shelf algorithms. The next step is to project the points we have already seen onto segments, assign probabilities um, to these points, also assign weights, because when we use points to uh, represent a data set, we want to know how big is the data set that is represented by the points. And then we output the segments and, um, and these points. So it's easy peasy. All right, so here's what this algorithm does on GPS. At the top, you see a video feed, and at the bottom, on the bottom left view, you see GPS points and the row segments rec uh, reconstructed from uh, real GPS points. Uh, on the lower right segment, you see um, the same map with the same segments reconstructed from the computed core sets. So at this point, we have seen already over 1,000 GPS points, and we have 21 core set points. 
And you can see that the maps look approximately similar. So this is kind of exciting uh, because we can obtain significant uh, reductions, order of, uh, two orders of magnitude reduction. And the most exciting thing about it is that um, you can apply the same algorithm in D dimensions, for example, to compress video streams. And here's a video from um, uh, the group OKGO OK at the top. And in blue, you see the features, um, the visual features in this video. And you can kind of see the segments as the video uh, rolls by. Well, we have an algorithm that can um, carefully identify these segments and create a core set tree incrementally. And once we have a core set tree, we have sing, um, single images that can represent the various image segments. And then we can take these images and pass them through software for, um, uh, such as the Berkeley Cafe system um, uh, that is able to extract the, um, the objects in these frames and map them to words. And now we have not only reduced the number of images uh, that we give the robots to, to reason about questions such as, have I been here before? But we also have words um, that allow us to summarize the images and also to, um, uh, uh, to connect to the world's knowledge through the internet. To give you a sense of the compression power of this technique, uh, the movie Birdman has over 165,000 frames and can be represented by a little bit over 1,000 corset uh, frames. Okay, so that's the end of my parenthesis. So what can we do with this? So corsets help summarize sig signals and map them to words. And this can enable new robot applications. So for example, in persistent surveillance for better security for all, we may have two security robots walking together down the street. And at one point, say they detect an open door. Well, using GPS, they can figure out the street address, look up the business online, uh, look up the opening hours uh, for the business and conclude whether uh, the door should be open or not. Or an agriculture robot could, test, uh, could check uh, online whether forecast repositories to decide whether to water or not. So now that we have seen a few ideas to increase the robot's communication and reasoning capabilities, I would like to discuss what we can do to make robots faster, because today's robots are, uh, are way too hard to, uh, to make. It really takes too much time to make robots today. I, I think of this as about where computing was before the invention of the compiler. Now, um, one idea is to moduli modularize robots. In other words, to make a universal particle that can be composed in many different ways to, uh, to create many different robot shapes very fast. And uh, as many of you know, my group has spent a lot of time um, thinking about how to make modular robots. And here's our latest module. It's called the M block. So M stands for magnet because the modules can connect with each other. Uh, momentum because inside the module there is a wheel that spins very fast and when you break um, the stored momentum propels the, the cube forward and also stands for magic because uh, these cubes have no external moving parts and we spend many magical moments playing with them. The pivoting direction for the cube can be controlled, so the, the wheel inside can be turned to provide motion about uh, the X, Y, and um, Z direction. And these, uh, these robots are a lot of fun. So, now, I spent many years thinking about modular robots, and while we made a lot of progress, we still have a way to go to create a physical realization of the dog couch, uh, which uh, together with Marty Vona, my, my um, undergraduate student from Dartmouth, we proposed in the 1990s. And I don't know how much longer this will take, uh, but we will continue to work towards this aspiration. However, to hedge a bit my bets, I started thinking that an alternative um, to making a universal robot module is to make one-of-a-kind custom robots very fast. In other words, to try to create a robot compiler. This could really enable pervasive um, robotics, and here's how. So let's imagine um, a user, and let's call her Alice. We'd like to give Alice the power to um, automate many tasks in her home. So say Alice wants a playmate for her cat while she's at home. Well, Alice 
Thomas could head to a new kind of store called 24-hour robot manufacturing, um, where using an intuitive interface, um, she could um, uh, select a design, and as soon as she satisfied with the design, the store could fabricate it, um, and the store could also create a programming environment customized for the robot. And um, after that, the, um, the, um, the robot would be fabricated right away, and the cost would be affordable. And the robot would have a playmate. All right, so how crazy is this idea? Well, here's, um, here's, here's the general idea. Can you imagine typing in your favorite word um, uh, processor, mine happens to, stay, to be e Emacs, I want a robot to play chess with me, and then having a parser that um, parses your specification, figures out the behavior. So for instance, for the chess robot, uh, you would need to be able to pick up a piece, move it to a different place on the board while not knocking down other pieces. From that, generating a design, generating the mechanisms capable to deliver on this, uh, fabricating the mechanism, and uh, uh, creating the programming environment, and uh, uh, voila, here's the robot playing chess. Okay, now this robot took about two hours to produce, but not all steps in the robot compiler process have been automated. But some of the steps are indeed automated, and I would like to explain to you um, uh, which and how. Our current solution to the robot compiler is a data-driven approach to design. Um, the user imagines um, some robot it would like to, uh, he would like or, uh, to create, maybe a robot duck or a robot ant. And uh, from this design, um, the, from this conceptualization, um, the user determines the functional mechanisms. Um, so for example, for robot ant, you need uh, a pincer and then you need legs. Now at this point, the system is able to automatically surge, compose, and segment existing designs uh, to come up with a new design that can deliver on this idea and also print the design. And here's the design. All right, so um, let's actually watch a video uh, that will show you that, in fact, some of these steps are truly automated. So here's the user uh, conceptualizing an ant, and here's the database. In this database, there are, um, there are two relevant modules. There's a pair of legs, and there's a single leg. And these can be composed into a set of three legs that could then, replicate it, could then be replicated to have two sets of legs and a body. In parallel with that, the uh, electromechanical components um, required to control and compute with this robot are also synthesized automatically. And the files required to fabricate the robots by printing, either on a 3D printer or a laser cutter, as well as the electronics files to the PCB layouts and the PCB assembly files uh, get generated automatically. The files get printed using um, either a laser cutter, 3D printer, or also low-tech paper and pencil. And then the user folds the design from, uh, from the flat fabricated piece uh, into a three-dimensional um, uh, working robot. The final step is to add the program, and this program is done um, as an app on the iPhone, so anybody can use it. And uh, here's an instance of, um, uh, uh, of uh, playing with a robot arm uh, from uh, such, an, uh, such, such a synthesized program. You can see that the user gets sliders, and um, this approach is fairly, um, fairly intuitive. Okay, so let's have a look a, a little bit under the hood to understand what is happening in the system. The system has three components. The first component is a database of existing designs. This database is extensible. Every time you create a new design, it gets added to the database. The system also has an interactive modeling component that allows the user to think about creating 3D structures 
And then behind the hood, some algorithms actually map those 3D structures onto uh, two-dimensional unfoldings of those structures that could be fabricated, as I showed you in the previous uh, video. And ultimately, finally, um, these piece, uh, once the files, once the automated fabrication files get um, created, uh, they can be sent to rapid prototypers for fabrication. All the designs in this system are parameterized, which means that you can use the same module to do short legs or long legs. And the design fabrication process is by unfolding a three-dimensional conceptualized piece into a flat piece. The designs are also composed hierarchically. Um, from parameterized components. And this is what the hierarchical composition for a, um, for a uh, two-dimensional crab-like robot might look like. Okay, the user can um, compose um, uh, the robot design, uh, reasoning in 3D, and the parameters can also be changed quite uh, easily by uh, pulling and stretching, in other words, by scaling in any um, which way um, the, the user wants. And let me try to uh, replay this so you can see this. Uh, as the user adds new parts, uh, you can see that the unfolding of the design gets automatically produced um, and uh, it gets adjusted according to what the user actions are. All right, so once a design is chosen, a simulation engine can check whether the design meets the specifications. So for example, we may check for stability, we may check for speed, we may check for payload. And if the design does not meet the specifications, the user has the opportunity to incrementally make the, uh, the adjustments and retry until the design meets the specifications. Many 3D printing techniques can be used to fabricate the design. In this case, uh, you can see a, a design that was printed using a 3D printer. You can also use laser cutters, vinyl cut cutters, or low-tech paper and pencil if you don't have these expensive machines. And once, um, once these um, uh, pieces are printed, uh, the user can um, assemble everything. And um, altogether, it takes about two hours to make a new robot from scratch. And the exciting thing is that the robot actually gets up and, and walks. The robot is actually functional. Now, the most time-consuming part of this process is actually folding the body of the robot. And so it's natural to ask, what can we do to automate the folding? And here's an example that says, well, yes, perhaps we can use folding. And in this case, um, this particular robot was folded uh, in an oven using baking. All right, here's the secret sauce. The secret sauce is that the body of the robot is composed as a three-layer structure. The top and bottom layers are structural, and the middle layer is a control layer. Uh, it's made of, of, out of a material that um, shrinks when exposed to heat. If you have kids, this is the same material that is used in the toy Shrinky Dink. Okay, so now by cutting gaps in the top and bottom structural layers, we can control the angle uh, this robot would fold at. And we can achieve convex and concave angles, we can achieve multi-angle multi structures. So here's what we can do with this. In fact, we can generate a compiler for self-folding. And this is how the pipeline might look like. Starting with a picture of the object uh, you would like to realize as a three-dimensional robot, you can use off-the-shelf techniques to compute a simplified mesh for this image. Then you can, also, you can use off-the-shelf techniques to unfold this mesh into a flat structure, watching and recording all the angles that, um, that are encountered during unfolding. 
Now you can use these angles to figure out how to cut um, yeah, gaps on the top and bottom structural layers um, and how to create files that you could then send directly to a laser cutter for fabrication and then put in an oven um, to bake your three-dimensional robot. And in this picture you can see the unfolding of the bunny and then the, the resulting um, uh, three-dimensional structure after uh, after uh, baking the, uh, the unfolded version in an oven. So here is a here's an, an actual real-time example of how you do this. Um, this particular robot was designed to fold on a heating pad and it was designed to run. This robot can travel at about four body lengths a second. Uh, the robot's trajectory can be controlled and the robot can travel in uh, many uh, different environments. It can even uh, swim on water. Uh, this robot can carry heavy things, it can climb inclines, and it can even find its way through clutter. The secret is that the robot has an embedded magnet in it and its trajectory is controlled um, using several electromagnetic um, coils that can be programmed to control the path of the robot along a desired trajectory. And when the robot is done with its task, it can recycle itself uh, by uh, dropping in a, in a bath that allows it to self-dissolve. In the case of this particular robot, it was acetone, but uh, the body of the robot can be dissolved in other materials. In fact, we can make robots that can dissolve in water. Um, so this is a very environmentally aware approach to creating uh, pervasive robots. We're not going to litter the planet. Now using this technique, uh, we can make small robots, like this one. Uh, we can make capable robots, so we can make robots that are capable of, um, of going around complicated trajectories and this robot does not lose, use uh, electromagnetic coils. This robot uh, has onboard uh, motion um, control um, uh, systems. If we don't care about um, how many sheets we use to make the robot, we can make also really big robots. So this robot is big. It was made out of many different components, each cut separately using a laser cutter. And we can make many different um, kinds of robots. And these, these, these are some examples of the robots we have created this way. We can make hundreds of robots, and we can try to use these robots to get kids excited about robots and programming. And this is a picture of a robot garden um, we have developed with my students uh, with the aim to advance personalized learning and get kids excited about robots. This garden is a modular system. Each, each flower in the garden is a robot. Um, the garden also has sheep and ducks. It's got a pond in the middle and you can have ducks on the pond. And we believe that this is an affordable educational platform uh, that would make it appealing to, um, to young students, in particular to middle schoolers, um, to begin to learn about robots and about programming. Um, here's a close-up of some of the components in the garden. The flowers have uh, LEDs embedded in them and we can program not just the motion of the flower but also um, their color. Uh, this is the sheep and here's the duck. Now one way in which we can use the garden uh, is to visualize the execution of classical graph algorithms. So we can treat each flower as a node in a graph and different colors uh, might encode different stages of your algorithm. For instance, here we see the execution of a breadth first search um, algorithm. And in red you see how the flowers get searched and in green you see uh, the path uh, that, uh, get, uh, that gets found. We can use the same to implement other kinds of algorithms. So this is uh, how depth first search might work. And altogether, I think we can use these ideas to make learning of computer science and robots more visual and creative and personalized for children. And if we can do this, I think we can get students excited. I think that the young students may come with some fresh ideas uh, that will help us get closer to, give, uh, to putting robots into the average person's hand to help with physical tasks. 
So, by the way, who knows how many robots are in this picture? Seventeen. That is wrong. Any other? Any other? Um, nineteen. Okay. Who said nineteen? We have a fi uh, we have a winner. Can you stand up, please? Somebody said nineteen. Ah, okay, great. Um, you're today's winner. Thank you very much. Please join me after the talk for your prize. <laughs> okay. So before I conclude, I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge many who have contributed to the ideas and the aspirations I described today. First, I would like to acknowledge my research group. My brilliant students and postdocs, they have great passion, great ideas, they work very hard, and they keep me on my toes, which is very important. I would also like to acknowledge my wonderful collaborators and friends, uh, because together we have shaped many research projects through very inspiring brainstorming and uh, working sessions. I would also like to acknowledge my sponsors um, because uh, they make me, uh, they, they make it possible. Uh, the robotics community for making it so exciting to be working in this field and also my teachers who got me started on this path. So let me end this talk by remarking that our great privilege is that we live in very interesting times and that our work in robotics is really making a difference today and will continue to do so increasingly. Now, today we have the added advantage that we are experiencing computing becoming a utility. And this was not the case at all when I got started, or it was not the case um, uh, during the times Regina mentioned, uh, when Regina got started. And this is remarkable because we can harness computation in making robots more intelligent and also in customizing robots. And just like the App Store has democratized access to computation, I really believe that the potential of democratizing and customizing um, physical tasks through easy to make and use robots is equally profound. And if we can do this, well, we will have many robots. And what's not to love? Thank you. for questions and there are microphones I have been told in the alleys so please come we have a couple of more minutes to questions and afterwards you can find uh, Daniela I'm sure she will tell you with great enthusiasm what's coming Yes, please. My name is Nathan Powell. I'm from the University of Washington. So I really like the idea of pervasive robotics, but one obstacle that I envision that I haven't necessarily seen super convincingly addressed is the economic obstacle. So for example, a robotic shopping cart has to compete in price not with current robots necessarily, but with existing shopping carts before it can be widely adopted. Do you see the manufacturing techniques you've been talking about uh, making that kind of price competitiveness possible, or do you see this as more reducing the price of current robots? robot manufacturing? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, we really need to have uh, effective um, models, um, economical models to bring robots into every person's life. I can tell you that um, with a robot compiler we're developing, the cost of the robots we're making is uh, anywhere from $10 up depending on, materi on, the, on the material that is used for the robot body and also on the electronic components. I would also like to remark that the first color printer cost $500,000 
dollars many years ago and now we have practically disposable printers. So I think that we will get at the price by developing uh, new technologies to um, make some of the steps uh, required to develop robots more efficient and effective, uh, but also the, uh, from the other end where the, the price of the hardware and the components um, will drop much like, um, like in the case of uh, most electronics today. Thank you. Toshi has a question. Yeah. Oh, yes. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Red. Can you tell me more about such a kind of scalability? from this kind of a robot, the kind of printing, so that maybe some of what is kind of easy to make, but uh, from the real world robotics, uh, can you tell me more kind of scalability, how to make such a more like uh, one robot for every task? <laughs> scalability. <laughs> So if you can, um, so I, I'm, I'm wondering if you're asking about the, the actual fabrication component or the computation component. Um, so the idea is that by automating the design process, we can make uh, different kinds of robots much faster. And in fact, we can take the task specifications, the, the, the requirements of your task, we can feed them into this robot compiler, which is by no means completely done. Um, it's just the beginning. Of an, um, of, a, of an approach to create increasingly more capable programs for generating robot designs. So, so we, we can speed up that process. Uh, we, can give, uh, we can give some automation steps to that process. Now, the robots, once you have designs, the robots can be made out of any material you want. So they can be made inexpensively to be used as educational toys, but you can also make uh, robots out of um, titanium, out out of, uh, out of what, ma whatever material you want. And the same design can be used to make a small robot or a big robot. Um. Well, I, I think we should, oh, there is one more. Yes, please. Hi, I'm here. Roderick That's Rose the last, from, last question. Yes, Roderick Rose from Sheffield. About the self-folding robots, I have a question. One is how, how durable are they? How long do they last? And the other is can you, time, can you time the folding process of different parts of the body during the construction? So uh, the robots that we self-folded are still research prototypes, um, but they're pretty durable. In fact, um, we will demonstrate uh, live the making of some of these robots in uh, one of the sessions this afternoon, I believe. So please come join us, and uh, you will see this. Um, uh, you will see the running robot being created and uh, and driving around. They are pretty durable, but they are small research prototypes for the time being, and. Um, the, the timing for self-folding is actually accounted for in the way we design the bodies, so in the way we create the, uh, the bridges and gaps in the structure layers. We can, uh, we can uh, create robots that, um, that are manufacturable in one step. So you put the flat sheet in, in the oven and the robot emerges as a single shed, but we can also create multi-step um, assembly processes. So these are very um, very fresh ideas. In fact, some of the first papers are in uh, ICRA today, but we hope that over time um, the robots will become uh, uh, bigger and uh, more reliable. Question? Question here? Ah, one more. Yeah. Okay. George Becky from USC. Um, sort of a two-part question, uh, Daniela. One is, as you know, in relations between human beings, emotions play an enormously important part rather than purely intellectual or physical contact. Do you visualize the development of emotional relationships both between robots and between robots and humans? And secondly, if you do that, do you visualize the development of a uh, um, I don't want to call it a religion, but some kind of an ethical basis for these relationships. 
I guess the answer is yes to both questions, though I'm not sure how much concreteness I can uh, add to the yeses. So uh, emotions are really important and even in um, transportation, uh, if you think about self-driving cars as, as coming, I mean even in transportation, emotions and silent communication between people uh, is so important to resolve some of the road uh, deadlock and uh, that remains a big challenge. So I, everything you're talking about is important, remains a challenge. I don't have answers yet. Thank you. With this, I conclude this session. Thank you, Daniela, and thank you, all of you. Thanks for a great talk, Daniela. And just a, a brief notice that the technical sessions are going to be starting upstairs on the sixth floor in about 10 minutes. There's escalators out on one side and stairs at the other end. And you know, please get, get there and get ready to listen to and learn great things. Before she got